I want you all to imagine, if you want to know what CERN is doing, I want you to imagine you come into a world and you find architecture all over the place, buildings and homes and houses, and you think they're beautiful and it's really a big discovery. You find out with the houses, you can house people, you can do many things with a house, with a structure. All of a sudden, after many years, you become curious and you say, what's holding all this together? And you begin to find, not nails that you can take out, but glue that has bonded itself to the materials. And you become interested in that glue that's holding the structure together. And so you're fascinated by this glue and you've tried everything to replicate it. You can't because it's hardened. Glue is hardened. You come to the realization the only way to find out how this glue is working is to break it down to its basic particles. And you have to have that glue in its former state, not the state after it's already hardened. Right? So you don't want it in the cured state, the state that you can see. You want it in its initial state, which is a liquid state, before it hardens. And so CERN, basically, is a device that will allow them to examine particles in their initial state, not after everything is bonded together. That's a very simple, simple way to look at what CERN is doing. They're trying to find the glue that holds everything together. It's what they're doing. That's the entire, that's the purpose of CERN. As of now, what has come out of CERN is called antimatter, which was first actually produced, it was first produced in 1955. And CERN is a very old organization, but it was produced in 1955 and they found positrons, which are anti-electrons. To understand what antimatter is, I'm gonna to have to explain very bare basics of what matter is. And, and believe me, it's gonna get very weird here shortly because you're gonna to begin to see exactly what they're doing. But you have to understand what you're looking at now. The matter, the matter and antimatter are in fact opposites. Now the matter that we have in front of us, if you take a piece of wood, nothing happens just a piece of wood. But if you set that wood on fire, you have caused a reaction. And then it, it's in a dangerous potential state, it's active. If you have a battery outside of your cell phone, it does nothing. You put the battery inside the cell phone, the electrons begin to flow. The electrons will flow from one place to another. Essentially, that's what electronics are, the control of electrons. They control the direction, the speed of electrons, which okay. create tiny pulses. They flow or don't flow, flow or don't flow. Those are called gates. Those gates form computers. And with a computer, we can do fascinating things. This is why they did, in fact, take Nikola Tesla's findings, because he discovered some things with electrons and protons that were very fascinating. Electricity within itself is a visual observation of electrons and protons in their active state, non-controlled state. Antimatter is the opposite of the matter that we can't control. Antimatter cannot be controlled. In fact, when they first produced antimatter, they had to have a facility to contain it because unlike the wood, where you have to have a reaction to cause it to burn antimatter, you have to have a containment to cause it not to burn. That's the only way they can store it, with massive facilities to store it. Let me give you an example. In a nuclear bomb, it takes timing, which takes electronics, and the explosions have to be just right to cause a reaction. That's a nuclear bomb, like the Hiroshima bomb, which takes pounds of nuclear material to cause it to react. And it has to, have, has to be very precise. Well, let's go the opposite. Let's say we had antimatter, correct? If we had one gram of antimatter, that would equal about 42 or 40, let's just say 45 kilotons of TNT, which is about four Hiroshima bombs. And it's, it's already inherently unstable. 
it's unstable. The only way to harness antimatter is to contain it. And it takes very large and expensive facilities to contain just one gram of antimatter. Some have failed, some have not. If those containment devices fail, they call them mega quakes. That's what happens when they fail. Now we're talking small, tiny drops of antimatter. I mean, just drops of raw antimatter. It, it's highly unstable. It has to be isolated from the rest of reality when it's contained in a literal sense. Our body is held together by that glue that they're searching for that bonds matter together. Those who understand what's called the standard model, they have a pretty good idea of what would happen if the force table in the standard, and the, if the standard model is just an explanation of how all things work. You're dealing with matter and force, and they have categorized the elements of matter, everything we can touch and feel and observe, in what's called quarks, the building blocks building blocks, I'm sorry, of protons and nuclei. They're looking for, what they're looking for is a higher explanation of how everything works. This is the particle they're searching for. Now they found half of it. They already found a component of it. That, but they also found with antimatter, this antimatter can be absorbed by any realm of paranormal activity. It is, in effect, neutralized and absorbed so there's a physical effect to the spiritual world and antimatter. And often, demonic entities and all these other paranormal things are attracted to antimatter. They're attracted to it. When they bring, when every, for every gram of antimatter that's produced and then it's bought into this world, when they produce it, it attracts things from another dimension coming here. What is CERN going to do is to allow humanity to produce pounds of antimatter. Then I hope people have a general understanding of matter, which we can touch and feel and observe, and antimatter, which we cannot touch, feel, or observe. However, it's working in tandem. CERN has yielded so many results and gave a true definition of paranormal activity. It's just it's beyond me that a lot of people cannot get this through the truth of the word. They, they can't. Antimatter is being pulled out of nowhere, out of this other dimension, which is nowhere but everywhere. In consequence to that, they found out antimatter has a specific type of energy signature that they can, in fact, detect. This is how they, it's part of the process of pulling it out. Now with the general basis of what CERN is doing, the, the very, that's the basic, basic idea of what they're doing. And, and that's exactly what they're doing with particles. Here comes the other part that's not so good. This is why they have to do another set of, listen, it's not just one experiment they're about to perform. This thing is gonna run six months continuously colliding protons near the speed of light to analyze particles, exotic particles that are, made, that are made at the beginning of the Big Bang. That's why they call it the Big Bang machine. It's the only way to observe these particles which wink in and out of existence in, I mean, a fraction of, of time. A fraction of time. And the consequence of this, of this search to gather more and more of this matter, by the way, they have a more efficient method of pulling out or, or, or gathering antimatter, which is why they need to know the properties of the, some more properties of this particle they have described. Once they have these properties, they will be able to extract as much antimatter as they desire efficiently. It, it's right now to obtain antimatter is very inefficient. It's very inefficient. In, in other words, to get a pound of it would take about 10,000 years at the current rate. It just, it's just not going to work. CERN will allow them to do that probably within a week. But here's the consequence. They've observed the energy of both matter and antimatter. They found out that 
antimatter is intimately tied to every single life form on this planet. They found out that energy, energy signature is the same energy signature in all life on this planet. All life, none excluded. Found out when any life form is in the presence of antimatter, the energy of the life form changes. The energy changes. I'll put this in basic terms. A person has both dark and light already in them. It's part of their makeup. It, it's what you can't live in a material world without antimatter. Nothing would exist. And so a person has both good good energy, which would be this realm, this, this realm of matter. But they also have energy of antimatter. So they're connected. A person is connected to both realms at the same time on the energy level. And they don't even know it. They don't know it. And they have found with it, certainly with all the experiments they found, they have found out why paranormal activity exists. They know exactly what it is. They don't want to tell anybody this is why they perpetuate foolishness on television. But every single person Every single life form is connected to that realm, that, that other realm, and to this realm of reality all the time. Now, a person's thoughts, how a person feels, and doctors know about this too, how a person feels will determine which energy they draw from. You can draw from this realm, good realm, and you have positive results. That's called faith. That's why doctors believe in it. That's why they give out placebos. They know that if a person believes something is helping them, they have it within themselves to repair. They can command their bodies to be repaired simply based on belief. And people think they work. And people have recovered from cancer. People have recovered from uh, back injuries. Uh, quadriplegics have been repaired simply by their own faith. This other realm, because that energy is contained in another dimension, so to speak. That's the containment wall. But when a person draws that energy in, it is, it is the opposite of this realm. In this realm, again, we have, to light, uh, we have to light a piece of wood with a flame to catch it on fire. In that realm, it's already on fire. You have to contain it to see the wood because it's engulfed in flames. It's the opposite of this realm. When a person changes their emotional state, their energy changes, and they begin to draw their energy from this other dimension, this chaotic and violent and uncontainable place where they draw dark matter from, intimately linked. And it's in operation all the time. Now the scientists, they are aware of this. Now here's the other part that's not so comforting. Uh, on the spring equinox, the forces change on the earth, and they know this. They know that forces do change, which will in fact allow them to have better results. And uh, believe me, it's timed perfectly. It is timed perfectly. With the basic introduction of what CERN is doing and what it is, and the, the dark matter and matter itself, now we get into the heart of the matter, uh, of what's actually what, there will be consequences. It's just that uh, there have been consequences before. Nobody took notice. And the energy of the energy signature of dark matter, which, by the way, resides everywhere. But once you bring it into this realm where we can actually see it and observe it, it attracts things from the other realm. Dark matter is tied to dark matter. Everything has a connection. Everything has a connection. That connection can never be broken by anything. If they bring dark matter into this realm, it's still connected to that realm where the dark matter came from. No matter how far away they put it anywhere, it's still connected. Because that realm is everywhere and it's still connected. Because it's connected, it effectively increases paranormal activity around where it's contained. And this is why they shift facilities of where they keep, they once kept dark matter in, in a uh, college. I won't name it for the sake of the college, but uh, 
the, the, or the university, they had to move it to a deep underground facility because of what was happening to the people in the college. People began to have vivid dreams, nightmares, uh, the violence began to erupt and vile things began to happen in those places. And it's because it's a chaotic piece of matter. It is just chaotic. And it's very difficult to, to contain something that is so powerfully chaotic. This is what an explosion is, by the way. When an atom bomb explodes, it releases chaos. Chaos in the form of chemicals, reactions, and everything is out of order. That is the, an explosion is the absence of order. That's what an explosion is. When you contain something, you're giving it order. So it's controlled. Here's the worst part. Understanding that dark matter is always connected to its source, which is that realm where the dark matter came from, the realm that's all around us. Just imagine that dark matter being the ocean, right? Imagine this realm being the submarine. We're all in the submarine having fun, and we're, we're doing our thing, and we have disagreements here, disagreements there. And then... Um, we find out there's a hole in the sub. But the hole is not, we thought the hole was in the sub, but it wasn't in the submarine itself. It was in fact in the people. The people's water inside their bodies began to increase based on their emotions. Let's just say that. And the dark matter can then come into this realm through people. That's in fact what they discovered in 1950, that people can also produce dark matter by way of, it's very minute, it's very tiny, but it's measurable, it's quantifiable. In fact, they now know how much energy a person has to have before they go absolutely berserk. They also know how much uh, of that energy signature a person must have before an entity from that realm can possess them, which also allowed them to understand that not everybody can be possessed. Not everybody can be, but they're, they're, the, the person has to be prepared to be possessed. They have to be, in, in essence, they have to be a portal themselves to be possessed. Not everybody can be possessed.